When Mauritius lost its preferential trade agreement with the EU for its sugar industry, there was a conundrum as to what to do with all this sugar. So the government went on a major diversification plan to generate fuel, alcohol and turn some of the massive sugar plantations into prime real estate development. They're called integrated resort schemes and properties here go for between 1.3 to 3 million US dollars. IRS schemes were put in place so investors could own property in Mauritius while also allowing expansion of the country's tourism sector. And the IRS scheme stands for Integrated Resort Scheme. Uh, it was really a mechanism for um, investors to own freehold property in Mauritius. Previously, this was ring-fenced to only Mauritian citizens. So, once again, it was an effort on the Mauritian government's part to open up the economy to allow a flow of foreign domestic income um, or foreign domestic investment. Uh, what it essentially does, it allows people to own underlying properties on ring-fenced estates. Predominantly the theme has been the golfing estates, uh, with Ernie Els having designed courses, Peter Makovic. Um, and also what it allows is those people buying those properties, um, the ability to get permanent resi residence associated with the property. So they're able to reside here in Mauritius and, and once again base themselves out of Mauritius. Um, the, there are a number of uh, schemes available on the island at the moment um, and also what Mauritius was hoping to do was they were looking with the increased uh, numbers of tourists, uh, tourists arriving in Mauritius, the IRS schemes would also provide additional accommodation for those people. But with the current global slowdown, IRS sales have slowed and so government introduced a cheaper option known as real estate schemes. Late last year, the Mauritian government recognized that the IRS developments, the big golf course de developments, which are principally priced between sort of one to sort of two million dollars, um, may find difficulty and may not have um, the same momentum. So they introduced a new regulation uh, allowing foreigners to buy into schemes referred to as the RES, which don't have the same um, price thresholds that the IRS had. So over the last sort of six months, um, we've seen the introduction of a different type of um, property ownership, um, essentially property that can be bought for under $500,000. Um, and that market over the last six months has not been as affected as the expensive uh, villa market. Unlike other housing markets around the world, the prices for these villas haven't dropped. When we see the downturn, the downturn is not affecting prices. We don't have an inventory of 80,000 units for sale, like in some other countries. So we have played it differently. Mauritius is an island, right? Land is very scarce. Over the next 10 years, at very most, you can have 4,000 4, villas, not more than that. So therefore, there is an inherent limitation in terms of how we can expand. And we are privileging inland development for these IRS projects so that we don't impinge furthermore on the fragile ecosystem that we already have. So it's been well thought out to attract high net worth individuals into Mauritius. And these people can engage into business, these people can run their family office out of Mauritius, these people can manage their wealth out of Mauritius. And that's the reason why we crafted it. At the same time, they can be tax resident in Mauritius. And if you're a tax resident in Mauritius, you don't get tax on your worldwide income unless it is remitted. So there's a very interesting tax efficient planning at, at, at the back of it. So it's not just a property player, as you can see. It hinges on a few other uh, key uh, um, ideas. Four years ago, the European Union cut the price of sugar by 36%, making it unprofitable to carry on farming. IRS schemes allowed farmers not only to sell their land, but also be part of the development process. Most of the development that has happened here has happened as a sort of joint venture between a foreign-based developer and a local landowner. So essentially the foreign based developer will bring the skill, the architects, um, the town planning um, and the marketing uh, capacity um, to the island and the landowner will bring in the land. Um, and so they will basically have a joint venture agreement between the two of them. Um, it's worked well because um, it, it, it's essentially meant for the developer that doesn't have a high capital outlay as far as paying for the land. Um, it's worked well for the uh, sugarcane farmers because they've been able to stay in the development um, and have a say in how the development um, works and also they've obviously had a say in the profits. Um, they've, had their, um, they've had their contribution of, of profits out of those developments. So it's been a, it's been a worthwhile exercise for them as, uh, as landowner. 
that the country hasn't simply shut up its sugar industry. Sugar is still exported, but with the EU slashing prices, value had to be added, and some serious consolidation and redistribution of skills had to take place. In 1998, we used to have eight sugar mills running in the region. And now, uh, since last year, we only have two running. And this year is going to be one and a half running only. So, which means that we've done a great deal of uh, centralization. And that was brought about mainly because of the EU sugar reform. Uh, it, what happened is the EU sugar regime has been reformed and uh, there has been a drastic f fall in the price so of 36%. So our, our sugar earnings drastically fell off 36%. So we've had to make a plan to survive. And this plan has been uh, divided in, in a few, few parts, if I may say. There's one part of co cost cutting, so both at the industrial level and at the field level. And on the revenue increasing side of things, we are now going from raw sugar exports to refined sugar. So which means that uh, there's an additional margin being made out of refined sugar. So we're now selling directly to the, con to the consumers. For Savannah, diversification is key. The company also uses its vast sugar plantations to produce almost a quarter of the country's power. Out of the sugar cane, when it comes into the mill, You've got on one side the juice going, which we produce sugar, and molasses. And on the other hand, you've got the fibers, it's called a bagasse. And with this bagasse, so we're producing electricity out of the bagasse in a big sophisticated power plant. So for the time being, this is a, what we call a biomass-fired power plant. It's one of the biggest in the world, actually. And we're producing uh, the island Electricity production out of bagasse in the island is almost 20%. Uh, and this power plant is fired with bagasse in the crop season and with coal in the intercrop. So this plant is now producing about 25% of the island's consumption. 